Well, I'm having a hard time believing it's Labor Day weekend. And even though fall doesn't exactly start until September 22nd, we all know that Labor Day is the official end to these long, lazy days of summer. It's the last time to wear this white robe that I've loved wearing so much this summer. Although I've been told in California you can wear white any dadgum time you want to. So you may see it coming back. Today is also a turning point for our church right before Memorial Day weekend. Our senior minister, Scott Cole Glazer, left on a three-month sabbatical. And the instructions he left to me were basically, try not to destroy the place while I'm gone. So this morning feels a little bit like Dad is coming home after a really long weekend away, and we had better get all the evidence of the party cleaned up really quickly. We have had an incredible summer with the inspiring people Scott chose to stand in his pulpit each week and share their wisdom about their ministry and their churches, as well as giving us insights into what God might be calling us to be in the coming days and years. As I thought back this week to all the messages we've heard from Father Boyle, Nancy Taylor, Shanna Stites, Bishop Flunder, our own Scott Carter, and all the other wonderful ministers, I realized there was one central message that I heard over and over again this summer. No matter what their scriptural text or the title of their message was, each of them all told us the same thing. They told us to be the church in Los Angeles. I've actually been wrestling with that idea all summer. What does it look like for us, for First Congregational Church of Los Angeles, to be the church in this time and in this place? In a wonderful conversation I had earlier this week in the midst of dreaming about creatively curating the next steps of Dr. Cole Glazer's dream for our church, an idea popped up about asking for your direct help. And so as I was sermonizing for today, I thought of the question I've been wanting to ask all of you since my first Sunday in worship nine months ago. Why are you here this morning? I know it sounds like the sort of existential question you'd get in a freshman philosophy class, but that's not really how I mean it. It isn't about the big existential questions like, why are you alive? Why are you here on earth? Why does any of this exist? No, I mean it in a very simple sense. Why are you here at church this morning? Because after all, you do have other options. You could be home sleeping in. You could be out running errands. You could be at Home Depot or the grocery store. You could be sipping coffee and eating eggs benedict because we all know that Sunday brunch is the best thing in the whole world. You could be in so many other places right now than sitting in these sort of uncomfortable pews on a holiday weekend. And yet, you are here. Why? One of my favorite narratives in the scriptures is found in 1 Kings. It's a story about the prophet Elijah. Elijah was a man who had a lot going on in his life. He was running from a powerful person who was trying to kill him. He was trying to understand what God was asking him to do. And he was working hard just to survive. At one point, Elijah sat down under a tree and said to God, I have had enough. Let me die and be done with this. It's too much for me. Elijah fell asleep and was later awakened by an angel who simply said, Get up and eat. Elijah looked around and found that there was fresh bread and water waiting for him. So he ate and drank and fell asleep again. Then the scripture says that angel of God came back a second time 
and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So Elijah ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, where the word of God came to him and asked, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here is such a great question. And while we might ask ourselves that offhandedly on many occasions, it's not a question that we spend much time answering. Most of us are here this morning even though we do have a million other places we could be. Our presence here this morning puts us in an increasingly small number of people who attend church on Sundays. I was reminded of those statistics again as I began reading a book by Emily Heath this week. In the book, she quotes Robert Putnam in his observations several years ago about the decline of social involvement in the United States. In 2000, Putnam published Bowling Alone, The Cat Laps and Revival of American Community. In writing the book, Putman says he drew on evidence including nearly half a million interviews over the last quarter of the 20th century to show that people in those years signed fewer petitions, belonged to fewer organizations that had actual meetings, knew their neighbors less, met with friends less frequently, and even socialized with their families less often. And Putnam famously contended, we are bowling alone. Because even though Americans were bowling more than ever before, they were not bowling in leagues. How many of you have ever bowled in a league? I never have. <laughs> this didn't really work for me really well because the thing that irritates me about those leagues, they do not let you have the bumper pads. I can bowl really well with the guards that go along there, but they didn't seem to think that was a good idea. <laughs> the metaphor of bowling, though, is woven throughout the book, and yet, of course, it isn't just about bowling. There's a steady decline in institutions that have traditionally been strong, including churches. So Freemasons are down 71%, the American Legion down 47%, this is surprising. Red Cross volunteers down 61%. The PTA down 60%. Rotary only down 25%. I don't really get that either. And the General Federation of Women's Clubs down 84%. Some have speculated that we have become a nation of non-joiners or unjoiners. And granted, we are less connected with one another via formal means, but we are also spending less time on those family dinners. They've dropped still by 43% since the mid-1990s. And having friends over to our house, that's down 35%. So it appears we're not trading club meetings for quality time with family and friends. It's also true that we are religioning alone. In matters of faith, we are more and more individualistic. Yet we are more spiritual today than we are religious. So exercise clubs like CrossFit and yoga meditation studios are booming. Most of us currently have or have had or will have a therapist who urges us to be our best selves. We are a people searching for self-actualization and spiritual perfection, and pretty much, we're doing it alone. I get the idea of the doing it alone part because I'm one of those people who understands this individualistic need. I always bristle when religious people bemoan individuals who are just spiritual. Because in all honesty, I probably am more spiritual than I am religious, and I'm a minister. I do believe that we can connect with God in the mountains, on a hike, at the movies, sitting on a beach, over brunch, 
or even at a party with good friends. I agree with all those things, and yet I don't think it's enough. And I wonder if that is why so many of us are here, in this particular place, on Sunday mornings. Perhaps our hearts are yearning for the something more, something that we can't get alone. A few weeks ago, Scott Carter so beautifully painted a picture of our services and how each element was woven into an experience that was somehow more than meaningful. I certainly know that's true for me. Some mornings it's a piece of music that deeply touches my soul. Other Sundays, a portion of Scott's sermon seems to have been written just for me. And often it's the overwhelming joy I feel as we walk out during the recessional. I don't know if you enjoy seeing me on the way out, but I love seeing each of you on the way out. This does not mean we are no longer individuals. We each come into this church on Sunday mornings in the midst of our own journeys, and we bring whatever is happening in our lives, be it for good or ill, to this place. We do this believing that in some mysterious way, as we come together, God is present, and the many roads we travel are converging as we sing and pray and listen and sit in silence together. Coming into this space on Sunday mornings is a conscious decision. We are making the choice to show up and join our voices and our hearts as we explore what faith means, as we ask the big questions of life, as we seek friends to walk with us, as we continue our journeys. Perhaps that's why I'm here. Perhaps that's why you're here and why each of us is here. So even though the statistics tell us there is a steady decline in church membership and in attendance, First Church is bucking those trends. We are not bowling alone. Our pews on Sunday morning are not filled with people who come to church simply because it's expected of them. This sanctuary on Sundays is not filled by those whose internalized religious guilt or their sense of familial obligation drives them into the pews. Rather, those of us who come through those big, beautiful doors at First Church and Stay are not here because we have to be. We're here because we want to be. We're here because we need the food that feeds our souls. We're here because we need to be reminded that we are loved by God. And we're here to learn how to love ourselves and to learn how to love others so that we can act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God together. May it be so. May it be so for each of us. Amen.